So when you compound interest, your rewards, it builds and you never really experience major loss because you still have a reward and you're building a good habit. All right, the time is now. Welcome, my friends, to the Time Is Now podcast with Dr. Slava Shut, where we interview some of the biggest names and the most entertaining entrepreneurs, and we're going to have a lot of fun. Today, I want to welcome to us as a guest, Mir. He is a host for More We Know podcast in finance and is currently on a weight loss journey. Let's all welcome Mir. Tell us about you, my friend. Hey, thanks so much for having me, doctor. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm really glad for the opportunity and that we can connect here today. Yeah, I mean, to go right into it, my name is Mir. Uh, I have been hosting a podcast called The More We Know Now. Um, we're coming up here now on two years. And, and really, when we look at the launch of The More We Know, the idea behind it was a mentorship platform. So during COVID, at the height of the pandemic, I was getting a lot of messages throughout social media of, what does life look like next? You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm losing my job. What is the stimulus check? What does all this mean? And for some weird reason, people came to me with it when I'm thinking, I don't have it figured out either. I'm, I'm trying to figure my life out as we go too. Um, but uh, I decided that the best thing to do maybe is leverage my network and start a mentorship platform. And the best way I could give people mentorship, I felt was through a podcast. So what I did is, is I created a little niche for myself, being that the podcast game, as you know, is, is crowded to an extent. So I came in on a mentorship side, meaning you're going to come to me as a mentorship platform. Um, and what I do is, is every single month, I bring on a mentor of the month. Um, and these have been people like the mayor of Miami, the founder of Reebok, um, so many different exciting guests and so many more exciting guests that are coming on. And fast forward, it is a top 10% mentorship podcast now in the world. Um, it's doing consistent numbers. It's growing and we're having a ton of different Gen Z's come on and, and people that just feel more confident in their life and, and empowered to have these mentors. So now we have thousands and thousands of people that come in every month just to listen to that new mentor. Um, so that's, that's sort of what I'm doing and, and what I'm looking to grow. And hopefully one day it can become the world's mentor that you can come to and, and find your mentor in whatever niche it is. So you basically like, do you match certain people with certain mentors? Like you connect uh, certain specific subscribers to certain mentors? So it's a, it's a good question, doctor. And the, the thing with the more we know that I've found interesting is because there's different listeners and different people that are looking to get into different industries. What I've done is I've made it my mission to bring on a multitude of different guests. So you might see that I brought on the mayor of Miami, but I also brought on the author of the Project Runway, right? The, the show about fashion. So I bring on so many different people that much like Netflix, you could come and find your mentor. And eventually when you're dropping a different mentor every month, it's going to pick and resonate with someone and you can pick who you want to be your mentor. Nice. So do you feel like you're making a difference already? A hundred percent. And I've, and initially when I asked myself when I was launching and I had only barely one or two downloads, I felt that I didn't know why I was doing it or what the goal was, but as I grew and I got, I got validation from the marketplace and streams started going up, I realized that I have a real opportunity here to make a difference. And that's indeed what I did. And it's been making a difference every single day since. That's awesome. So, you know, we talk about, I've given actually, you know, different videos on expectations and reality, right? Is there anything from your expectations of this project and the reality, are there any differences in a good or a bad way? Yeah, I think, I mean, when I, when I initially envisioned it, I wanted to become the biggest, right? I want to be like Joe Rogan or, or have the big mentorship platform like a Lewis and, you know, but as you come into fruition, you realize it's not that easy, right? And so what I've learned in that process is that when you set an end goal on the expectations you're creating, you're almost setting yourself up for failure, as opposed to saying that, let me just take one day at a time and let me just take it one guest at a time or, or one pound at a time or whatever it might be. And that way, overall, when you look back, you can say, wow, this is what I did. Like, even when I had my first guest, I didn't know how to get guests. I didn't know how to get the mayor of Miami, but I took it one guest at a time. And when I look back now, I can say, wow, I brought on the mayor. 
Um, I've, I've built a relationship with the mayor. You know, we've done, we're working now on, with the Morino community on potential fintech internships in Miami. So there's there's so many different things where you can look back and say, wow. So I, I love that you asked that question because I think we do need to separate a little bit expectation versus reality, but also enjoy the process of while we're doing it. That's awesome. That's beautiful, man. You know, I, I love how, you know, you've taken something and made it positive, you know, for whatever reason, there's a lot of still negative thoughts about mental health, mentorships, coaches, uh, for whatever reason. I mean, there's a lot of amazing coaches out there. There's a lot of inspiring people out there. There's a lot of great psychologists. And what we've learned through this pandemic, and a lot of people are having psychological issues. They're having directional issues. They're having you know, issues being stuck where they are. And I love that you created a space that literally brings to the forefront, you know, you seem like a young guy and, you know, you talked about Gen Zers already, that you're bringing people into a place where they feel safe to get mentored. They get safe to get advice and direction. And for whatever reason, ego or whatever it may be, people are still have a bad stigma about getting help and direction. So I'm big about it and you seem to be big about it. Maybe, you know, the bigger we get, we could branch out to more and more people say, look, there's no stigma here. Go get, go get a mentor. A mentor could help you. A coach could help you. A directional person could help you find your path. Yeah, I, I look. I, at the end of the day, I don't know what the stigma is with having a coach or a mentor, or because at the end of the day, if someone's done something that you want to do, the simple formula would be to effectively follow their footsteps, or or maybe they can help you uh, shorten the learning curve, so to speak, by giving you tips from the mistakes they made. And that's why, on the more we know, I focus so much on the failure aspect because. We could talk about the glamorization, you know, when I, even when I brought on um, Joe, the, Joe Foster, the founder of Reebok, uh, we could talk all day about how he built a massive billions and billions of dollars of a company. But I'd like to talk more about what was the process like when you were in your 20s and everything was against you and all the odds were against you, because we all have those questions. And if we can uncover it, and like you said, to your point, doctor, build a community where we can remove the stigma and realize that having a therapist is okay, that having a coach is okay, having a personal trainer is okay, having a mentor is okay, I think we can all be a lot more successful. That, that's, that's amazing. So it's funny that you mentioned that. So my next question to you is, what is the worst career decision you've ever made? Worst career decision I ever made? <laughs> That's a good question. I would say it actually goes back to college. Um, I didn't take advantage early on in my career, and, and I consider college a career to an extent because you're doing it full time. Um, I did not consider the opportunity to take advantage of one, every resource in college, and two, the internship opportunities. Because I wasn't proactive, I ended up losing a lot of opportunity. If I could go back right now and, and, and to anyone listening and you're going through college now, every single summer and every single winter, I would have taken advantage of internships. I, that's the time where you go explore different opportunities. You can go work for a chiropractor, go work for a financial firm, go try out everything because you're trying to figure that out, right? So I didn't take advantage of that. And what I ended up having to do or doing after graduating college is I had to sort of go figure it out and learn on my own. And that cost me time and that cost me lessons and time costs money. Um, and, you know, you can make money back. So I'm, I'm never tripping about losing money, but it's hard to get the time back. So if I could urge anyone, especially that's going through the college right now, don't make the same expensive I mistake, expensive mistake I made early on in my career by not taking advantage of different internships, because that's how you learn. Absolutely. And that's exactly what I did. So between I moved several times during my college career, right? So I lost credits from one school not being to the other. And I still finished a bachelor's, master's, and a doctorate in nine years. All because wow. I maximized the summers in betweens. And I, I was nonstop for nine years. Wow. And for that reason, I was never really off track. And I actually got my doctorate uh, at 28 years old, which was uh, pretty young because I kept focusing on track. So that, that's amazing. What do you love about your career? I love the, the opportunity I get to meet people every single day. 
I love the chance of just connecting with different people, helping them achieve their goals and being able to solve problems for folks. So for me, that's the most exciting thing. I, I can't be in a career where I'm not involved with people. Like I couldn't sit there and look at spreadsheets all day. Like I have to be involved in talking to people, like even getting on this podcast with you right now, my day has been, I'm looking at my calendar here since literally 5.30 a.m. and I'm still trying to do a workout and, and lose this weight. So I have so much energy because I love talking to people like this, talking to you is way more exciting than sitting there and looking at spreadsheets. So. For me, the most exciting thing is getting to talk to different people every day. That's awesome. And I appreciate the compliment that I am much more exciting than a spreadsheet. I want everybody to know. <laughs> everybody hear that? I am much more exciting than a spreadsheet. So if you could yes. if you could travel back in time, right, at any point in history, where would it be and why? You know, I would like to go back to the – and do you mean geographically or you just mean time stamps? time stamped, uh, and, and, and why? If you're going to pick a place in history, you probably geographically, because borders have changed, that may change too. Oh, good point. You know, I would go back and live through the era of Henry Ford. Um, I'd love to go back and, and learn more about the idea of how he launched Ford, because they started with horses. And so if I could sit there and watch his journey and see his mind in that day and age and say, how did Henry Ford do what he did and get to where he got? So if I could sit there and learn from Henry Ford back in the day, that would be amazing. So I, I would definitely love to live through that period. So you're going to be here in the good old United States then? <laughs> yes, yes. Exactly. You're not going anywhere out of these confines. I just, I, I really admire what he was able to do. You know, of course, I can look back and say it would be cool to look at Jurassic Park. It would be cool to look at this. But from a, dialing back to the initial uh, uh, mentorship topic, I'd love to just be able to sit there and learn from Henry Ford. That's a good one. That's a good one. So what is, what is one thing you own that you wish you didn't? One thing I own that I wish I didn't. You know, sometimes, sometimes it's the smartphone, right? It's like, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because I think having social media now and access to everything has, has opened up doors for people in so many different ways. Like you and I getting on this podcast now, you have this popular podcast and you're a phenomenal doctor and um, we wouldn't have connected if it wasn't for social media. But on the flip side, the problem I find with social media is that we end up comparing to others a lot. And I find I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a psychologist, but I have found that my generation, because I'm, to, I, like, I'm, I'm part of tens of thousands of Gen Zs through the more we know, a lot of us are depressed. Like a lot of us are suffering with some form of mental illness. And, and I can't help but say that social media contributes to that in some capacity. So, you know, we talk about this very often and there are studies, there are medical studies to confirm exactly what you just said. So the problem with the neural impulses, I'm going to keep it simple and not too crazy out of the box. I don't want anybody falling asleep on me, but there are studies to prove how much of these non-reality, these screens, these blue lights, what they do to young minds. And it's not only when you get to this point, remember, we've had this already for years upon years. So you've not only experienced social media now, you've experienced it for several, you know, decade and a half, if not longer. And the problem is back then it was more of an influence on you than it is now. However, some of the things are adding up. And when people are getting away from the reality of conversations and they're only in this digital platform, it's interesting how right you are about the psychological problems they're having. And it's getting worse with each successive generation because that's all they know. And sure. you ever been to the mall and you see like five teenage kids at one table, they're all texting each other. Like yep. there's no conversation. It, it, it's, it's mind blowing. So you add up all these different things and there is a, you know, neurotransmittal component to it. There, it, it is medical. Okay. And you add this, interactive screen and it's not all reality i mean and with this metaverse and all that it's probably gonna get even worse so you know we need to get back to old school and you know even though you're a gen zer the fact that you even like talking to people is a really amazing thing so that's becoming a lost art 
So that's why we have these platforms. Like you said, it's amazing that we have social media and these phones and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, it is a detriment. It was supposed to be correct, kind of funny in a way, but uh, you know, because we all have some of these guilty pleasures and like, man, I shouldn't have bought that watch or whatever or that car or you know or that treadmill that's sitting there and collecting dust now in the hangar. You know, correct. But, uh, but that's funny that you say, you know, the social media platforms and the, and the phones. It, it's amazing to have this computer in our hands, but at the same time, it can be a detriment. Correct. That's why Correct. I recommend to everybody, at least once a week for about 24 hours, turn off the phone, turn off electronics and stuff, and read books and do normal things and stay away from the platforms. And I think that's really that. good. What type, so, what type of doctor are you? I'm a doctor of physical therapy. Awesome, awesome. So I have outpatient uh, physical therapy clinics. We help people, you know, physically, spiritually, mentally. You know, I, I would say 75% of my job is actually psychology. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> I bet. Where's, 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 the, where's the clinic? Uh, I have clinics in Los Angeles area. Awesome, awesome, for sure. And possibly soon to be uh, in your neck of the woods. I, I, I'm guessing you're in Miami. Uh, so I, I do love Miami. I spend some time in Miami, but I'm in Chicago currently. Oh, you're in Chicago. Okay, okay. Yes, so how how'd you connect with the mayor of Miami of being in Chicago? Yeah, good question. So um, early on when I, uh, I, was a, I was a follower of Mayor Suarez and on social media. And for um, the, the longest time, what I loved about the mayor of Miami is how active he was on social media. So what I actually did is um, I have a shout out to a friend of mine by the name of, um, he goes by Sauce Talk Money, Adam Sosnick. He works for Valuetainment, who is AKA Patrick Bet David. And Patrick hosts one of the largest podcasts in America right now. If you look him up, Patrick Bet David, he founded the uh, PHP agency, which is the financial services firm, ended up selling for hundreds, hundreds of millions of dollars. And now they have the Valuetainment podcast. And so Adam knew the mayor of Miami. Adam was a guy who came on my podcast. And Adam was the, uh, he was the best man at the uh, Kardashian wedding. And so, I connected through Adam and I saw the connection to the mayor of Miami. But the funny thing is here, this is about having genuine relationships in your life. It's a good lesson for people. The podcast I did with Adam is not on my page because I lost the file. My computer crashed and I lost Adam's podcast and a few other podcasts. And despite that, still maintained the connection and the relationship. And I ended up DMing the mayor. He saw my connections in Miami and the mayor responded and he was like, let's do it. And that was it. The rest was history. Wow. That, that's amazing. And that's a great point. Real relationships, real connections, people. You know, we love reality more than these, just the digital world. I, I promise you, you could be on social media. I'm not saying get rid of your TikToks and your Instagrams and your Facebooks. Keep it. It's all fantastic. It's all amazing. Mm -hmm. But get out, make some connections, talk to some people, do some real connecting. You know, the, mo if the more sleeping, hands you shake, the more money you make, right? Exactly. I don't know how many times I've said that. I love it. That's exactly, I, I say that I don't know how often. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any guilty pleasures that you're willing to share? I know you're on this like weight loss journey. We're going to talk about that in a second. But is there any guilty pleasures that are really like, man, I got to have look, it. Gotta have it. Look, look, I'll tell you this. For the reason I was able to build an audience early on, and even before The More We Know, I had a fitness movement called Commit With Mir. And that was one of the uh, larger fitness movements in Chicago at the time being when I was in college. We sold probably 800 shirts in one semester, which was a lot to me because I was like, wow, I'm, 20, like I'm 18 years old selling these shirts. Why do people believe in me? Uh, I built the relationship based on my genuineness, right? So I, I am very open with audiences which means they see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and if I want to speak about guilty pleasures for me, it actually goes twofold with your next question about the weight loss journey. My guilty pleasure is food. And I still suffer with a bad relationship with food and I'm not fully healed there yet. So I, I tend to go to food a lot in situations um, and I need to work on that. So that, that's where my relationship with food is still this roller coaster that's so sporadic. So I'm trying to build a better relationship and better eating habits because I've lost 100 pounds before. I'm working on losing my last 100, which I'm sure we'll get into right now. Uh, but it's a it's a knife fight every single day. Every time I see the food, every time at nighttime, I have the cravings. My guilty pleasures is food. So is there anything in particular? Is there something that you really have a hard time putting down? <laughs> 
I, I like cheese, you know, it sounds weird, but I'm, I'm a big cheese fan. Like I like crackers and cheese and, um, you know, pizza and things like that. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm saying that now, but if you, if you met me three years ago, I would never say that because I was so committed. But once you adopt the bad habit, I've always had like this pleasure for like cheese and pizza and, and things of that. So, you know, we talk about often, you know, in science, there's a lot of research behind this. You know, it takes about 21 to about 30 days to build a habit. Now, any habit that you want to build, you always want to reward that habit to build it. Now, some people use food to build a good habit. In your case, you're trying to get rid of one of the habits. So can you find in your own way something that makes you happy that you could reward yourself from actually not completely eliminating, but let's say refraining with a certain amount of a food to reward yourself to build that habit? Yeah, I, I think I could. Um, I think I could, you know, just, just listening to you talk about it, there's definitely potential. I would just have to figure out how to, uh, to go about that. That's awesome. So that, that's right there. You know, I, I love it and I love helping people and I try to bring value to people's lives. One thing that I can recommend, recommend to you is find that one thing that you could have immediate reward of, to get you on your way to not indulge in something that would be a bad habit as a reward. And what, what example would you give? Like how, how could I actually take actionable steps to do so? Okay. For instance, let's say, let's say you have one pizza a day. I'm just using a random example. Okay. So today you're only going to have three quarters of the pizza, right? The fact that you had only three quarters of the pizza for right now, instead of the full pizza, all right, you're going to reward immediately with something that gives you pleasure and happiness to reward only having three quarters of the pizza. Now, there's two rewards there. One, you still had your pizza, right? Number two, you've already, because let's say if you have it every day, that quarter, 25% less of a pizza over a month is a lot of calories. You just saved yourself X amount. Now, the other positive thing is you've rewarded it, so you're building the habit anyway. And eventually you'll be cut down to maybe a quarter of a pizza or a slice or whatever that may be, and you rewarded it immediately with something else that makes you happy. So okay, you just- it's a compound to, effect. Exactly. So you just compound interest your rewards. You see what I'm saying? I love that. I love that. Compound interest, your rewards. I really like that. So when you compound interest, your rewards, it builds and you never really experience major loss because you still have a reward and you're building a good habit. And mm. in the converse, you're decreasing calories and you're on your way, my friend. So I needed that. So that kind of, that kind of compound effect and that kind of reasoning you're never at a loss because what happens is why do people quit hard things? Because they're hard, right? It's human nature, path of least resistance. So if you could reward good behavior, you never lose. Reward good. Yeah. Know. Wow. I didn't look at it like that. I'm going to come back and I'm going to have oh. to shout you out when I lose this weight. Absolutely. Well, don't, don't wait until we, we could be on this journey together. My friend, this is how it works. So I'm happy to help people and I know you're helping people. So this ripple effect hopefully goes all around the world. So we're here to help each other, right? We're, there should be more that unites us than divides us. And so I, I, need to, I need to start that today. Absolutely. Make that commitment to myself. I love so that. You, I you have to find that positive reinforcement. And by the way, once again, this is science. This isn't Dr. Slava just came up with something out of his behind. You know, there's science behind all this. So there's a evidence-based practice of what I just said. So it's good stuff. Uh, there's a lot of literature behind it. Uh, anybody's welcome to contact me. Uh, and I recommend you guys keep in touch, Amir, and, you know, help along with this journey, man. We're all in this together. So, Dr. Slava, I needed that. Thank you. 
No worries, man. Who inspires you? And who do you aspire to be like? Two different questions. My, uh, my mother really inspires me. Um, what she's gone through and, and her journey and her life and where she's gotten to today, every single day she inspires me. Um, and the good that she does to the community and, and how she gives back shows me that in a world that's full of negativity and despair, there is love and positivity and you can win through that, right? So the empathy that my mother shows every single day to her patients, to her friends, to her family has really inspired me to find the good in the world and to uh, accomplish much. Who do I strive to be like? I, I don't like to have idols, but I will tell you this. Ray Dalio, Ray Dalio who is in the uh, top 20 um, richest men, and I don't say that because of his net worth, but I say that because there's a lesson behind it. He owns Bridgewater, which is one of the largest hedge funds in the world. Um, they have billions and billions under management. But what I think is inspiring about Ray Dalio and why I want to be like him is he has humility. Uh, Ray Dalio, when he was my age, 25, his hedge fund went bankrupt. And so he lost his entire savings. He lost his client's money. He lost credibility. He lost trust. He was embarrassed. He had to go back and live at home. And then he had to go back and ask his father for $4,000 because he had no money, which at the time, $4,000 is like thirty dollars or $40,000 in today's money. And so uh, as a result, to look at that and to see that he came back and he is now one of the wealthiest hedge fund managers in the world and has empowered and inspired people through his book principles, I would inspire to be like him one day. And hopefully I will. That's cool. And we wish you all the best in that journey, man. I want to I want to see you Fortune 500 <clears throat> rocking it. So I can say I knew him when, you know. You knew me before those days, exactly. And then I'm going to say the same for you. Oh, amen, amen, amen. So are you a daredevil? Like if I was to say shark diving, bungee jumping, or skydiving, are you into any of those? Whew, uh, you know, I... I'm not, to be honest. I want to be. I'm a risk taker, but I'm not a daredevil. So I think there's a difference. I do take risks and I take a lot of them, but I am not a daredevil as much as I'd like to be, though. I would so like to be. No chance anybody's throwing you out of an airplane. No one can throw me out of an airplane just yet. <laughs> no, not yet. I, t I say the same thing, man. I'm a big guy. You know what? If, if I decide I'm not going out that door, nobody is getting me out nobody, that door. Nobody's I, moving you from that. There is nobody moving me. I don't care if they could have three people's tandem to me. If I decide I'm not going out that door, which I'll never go up there. If I know I'm going out that door, not a chance. So oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just oh, yeah. think it's funny uh, to see, you know, who the daredevil out there is. So you yeah. seem like a daredevil in business, but you sure as hell will not be a daredevil, um, you know, bullfighter. You will, not, you will not get me swimming with sharks. You will not get me jumping off an airplane. You will not see me doing no bungee jumping. <laughs> My man, good. Oh. So what piece of art, book, music, movies, uh, most influenced the person you are today? Um, Drake, the rapper Drake, has influenced me definitely when we talk about art. I think what Drake has been able to do for the, the culture, um, and he came from a, a family where – Drake was an actor and he ended up building a career in music. But not only that, Drake, if you look at the span of his career, has been able to really diversify his portfolio. So he's gone from hip hop to rap to Jamaican style to dance music in his latest album. And, you know, I think what I've learned from Drake, when you think of the term daredevil as an analogy, he's been a daredevil in his career by trying on different genres, by linking up with different artists, by, by facing adversity. Drake's also had a ton of adversity and doubt. And so for me, when I talk about inspirational by art, I think he's one of those once in a lifetime type artists that inspires me um, through what he's been able to build in his music career. Nice. Uh, what's your favorite Drake song? Oh my gosh, man. You're putting me on the spot. Favorite Drake song. Wow. Favorite Drake song. Um, so many, I, I love so many Drake songs, but if I had to pinpoint one, um, one of my favorite Drake songs ever is Pound Cake. It's on his uh, album, Nothing Was the Same. And I just think that song there that he did with Jay-Z was when you started seeing the retrospective shift in his career. 
where he started going to that next level. Like now he's doing music with Jay Z and, and the bigger rappers, and you know now Drake is earning that respect and credibility. And he talks about that pain that he faced in high school, and because he was where, where I really relate to Drake is he was bullied in high school, and I can't tell you enough that uh, I was bullied in high school too. So I went through that. I, I share that similar uh, uh, degree of uh, bullying. Now <laughs> I'm not Drake, but you know to be able to share that was uh, was definitely unique. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I was, uh, people find this hard to believe with my personality now, but uh, I too was bullied uh, most of my life until um, I got a lot bigger uh, and, you know, started learning different things. And um, then I didn't get bullied anymore, but it was, it was rough up until like the early even parts of high school. And um, it, it was a horrible thing. Now it's interesting. Some of the people that were bullied, some went in bad directions and it, you hear more and more of these people, these entrepreneurs and these people, um, these artists, you know, I didn't know Drake was bullied, but look what he's done, revolutionize, you know, his genre of music and, you know, great performer, uh, great businessman, you know. So it's interesting how, again, adversity builds later in life, you know, all those things that, like you said, you know, you're not looking for all the successes, what are the failures that you had and how did you overcome them? You know, the bigger to fall, the bigger to bounce, you know? So it's, it's crazy how the shift back from all those negative dark times brings you to a higher level. The more we're, we're, we're squeezed as a person, more light shines. hundred percent, a hundred percent. That's awesome, man. So where can we find you? Any last words? Uh, give us everywhere that people get a hold of you. I want people flocking uh, to your site. I want I want everybody who's out there to find the mentor that they need. Uh, doctor, thank you so much. So you guys can find me. Just type in my name on Google, uh, Samir Sawakit. It's S-A-M-E-E-R, last name S-A-W-A-Q as in Queen E. Edward D. Daniel. If that's too complicated and that's a mouthful, you can also type in commit with Mir, commit with M-E-E-R. Um, you can also just type into Google, the more we know podcast and a lot of different things will come up. Or you can find me on Apple, Spotify, YouTube under the more we know, or you can look up my full name on Instagram and find me there as well. And I will be branching off into uh, several more social media platforms soon and working on different partnerships. Uh, in terms of last words, the, the only thing I could give doctor is that um, to never let up. And I'm still in a point at an inflection point in my career where I still day to day ask myself, is it time to throw in the towel? And I still face that demon every single day because I've gone through a significant amount of challenges and failures in my life. But when I go back and remember the peace, the gratitude, the, the, the humbleness, um, and, you know, I, I remember that having the sense of gratitude is, is really something strong. So my, my mentor is, is a gentleman by the name of uh, Dave Metzler, who you might have heard of. And, you know, Dave, Dave is, a, is a good friend and a mentor. And one thing he always says, and he says to me is, the problems that you're going through, right? Like maybe you lost money on XYZ investment, or maybe you're going through something with a client or a relationship or a spouse. The problems that you're having are actually in a way gratitude because the fact that you're overwhelmed with problems means that you have so many blessings as well, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this sense of gratitude. So that's what I learned from him. So if, if the audience can take away anything, it's never, ever let up. And then don't let small-minded people take you away from the goals that you want to accomplish. Because I remember when I first did my first episode of The More We Know, I had even my closest friends, some of them aren't my friends anymore, that would tell me, you should not do a podcast because that space is extremely crowded. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have met you. I wouldn't have had a mentor like Dave Metzler. I wouldn't be going on his show on Bloomberg in August. That's going to be with, you know, the likes of Wolfgang Puck and Grant Cardone and Ed Milet and all these different people. And I wouldn't have had those opportunities. So never let up and you never know where you're going to go and do not let the small minds impact you. That's what I got to say. That's beautiful. And I, sh I think you should never let up ever, ever. And I want you to feel the responsibility that you're needed out there. Right. And there's not enough of you and that you have a responsibility to show the world your gifts, your talents, 
and never let up. I love it. I love it. Very positive message. Uh, I love it. It's been a pleasure, my man. Uh, hopefully we'll get to talk again soon. And I, I'd love to know your, about your journey and, you know, where you're headed and everything that's going on. And especially, you know, the things that you do with David and everything. So, and uh, the weight loss journey and how you're using the positive habits. So thank you, friends. Uh, that's it for today. Remember to tune in to us every Friday at 8 a.m. We're, we're trying to do big things here. So thank you, thank you, thank you.